finish uh, doing this speech and then we're going to part. So we're going to give over to the regional uh, coordinator that will introduce all to, to us all of the guests that are here, uh, regional coordinator. the RETF, the ETFs, and ground forces of the ENF in Nelson Mandela. My name is Vai Tango Kutula Mnogoti. I am the deputy chair of the province, and I am deployed with Nelson Mandela to coordinate elections. My role today is very small, is to introduce the people that are amongst us. I will start with the RETF. I won't call them by name, I won't call them one by one. They must just stand and wave. <laughs> then amongst us we have Union Abanya Kudin Mekit. Isaf in Absal GP, they have sent a message to say solidarity, they are with us, but they have other events, so they can form part of this gathering. <laughs> Lastly, let me introduce Ufaita Rimbo, Malibo Ozi, Yeah. 
Bergman, Samuel Kapuru, Nkosi, Kundisa, Natasha Kakwini, member of the Central Command Team, where she deployed to be the convener of the Regional Elections Task Force here in a very important region of Nelson Mandela in the Eastern Cape Province. Want to send our greetings to the members of the Regional Elections Task Force, Branch Elections Task Forces, but most importantly to all the ground forces of the EFF who are in the VD Elections Task Forces. Also greet the member of Parliament, Fighter Leo Matikos, who is the member of Parliament deployed by the Economic Freedom Fighters and as the champion in the interests and aspirations of workers. Let's take this opportunity to also greet the Lungisi Madonsela Battalion of students and youth who must go and mobilize all the young people of Nelson Mandela to vote for the Economic Freedom Fighters on the 29th of May. It is great that we are gathering here fighters as a collective of all the sub-regions of Nelson Mandela under one group. Because since the beginning of the elections program, we have been meeting in our separate sub-regions to coordinate work at sub-regional levels and give reports at that level. It's important that on this day, the 1st of May, 2024, we gather to honor, but also to celebrate Workers' Day. So Workers' Day is a very important day in the history of the working class all over the world. As we gather here in Raymond Kama Sports Center, there are millions, if not billions, of people all over the world who are marking this day, the 1st of May, because it is not just the Workers' Day in South Africa, it is International Workers' Day all over the world. More than 168 countries all over the world, they pause on the 1st of May to celebrate and honor the contributions of workers in our lives, but also to demand the basic interests and aspirations of the working class and workers all over the world. So this day, my class, it's one of the very few days which are internationally commemorated and celebrated. So outside of Christmas and Good Friday, Workers' Day is a day that is celebrated all over the world. So the People's Republic of China, which has got a population of more than 1.4 billion people, has got the 1st of May as a public holiday, meaning that there is no where workers are resting today in a country which has got more than 600 million people who have got jobs and are working in the People's Republic of China. We can say that also in the Russian Federation, it's a public holiday today to honor workers. In Cuba, the Socialist Republic of Cuba, it's a public holiday today in Venezuela and Brazil, in Tanzania and Zimbabwe, in Zambia and Ghana, in many other parts of the world, workers are saying, let us honor the contribution of workers to the world that live in. And it is important that every time you gather, every time you go to a gathering of the Economic Freedom Fighters, when you leave that gathering, you should be a different person. Your levels of information, your levels of understanding, your levels of information should have been better than when you came to a gathering of the EFF. It is therefore an obligation of all leaders of the EFM who address and speak to our people that at all times you must know that whatever you are going to say on behalf of the EFM in front of the people, one is that whatever
whatever you say must be informative. Two, it must be educational. Three, but also it must be agitating. That people must leave any gathering and every gathering of the EFF with a renewed hope, with a renewed spirit to fight on for the emancipation and true liberation of the working class and workers in general. So fighters have already indicated that this workers' day is not just a holiday in South Africa. In fact, South Africa only began to have the main day, the 1st of May as a holiday from 1995. And it was joining hundreds of countries which since the 1800s had already declared that the 1st of May is Workers' Day. And the reason why the 1st of May was chosen to be a Workers' Day is because the Second International, an organization which used to be called the International Working Men's Association, which Karl Marx, whom we follow, was a member of, is the organization in Paris in the 1800s that took a decision that as workers of the world who must unite, let us get a day in the 365 days of a calendar year where workers will say, this is our day. And the delegation in the second international that came from Chicago in the United States of America said that let us designate the 1st of May as a workers' day in commemoration of the workers that were massacred in Chicago when they were fighting for an eight-hour working day. Then there was agreement and resolution and consensus amongst all the progressive forces of the world that the 1st of May is an international workers' day. In other countries, they call it Labor Day. Some they just call it Workers' Day. But majority, an absolute majority of countries all over the world celebrate Workers' Day. But also, let us take this opportunity to pay tribute to workers' leaders who began to organize and associate with the struggles of the working class from here in Canada, here in Nelson Mandela Bay. One of South Africa's greatest trade unionists and anti apartheid activists was called Wiesle He came and organized workers here in Canada, which of course was called Portuguese Bay. He was a threat to the apartheid established. We said, I mean, if you check the history of trade unionism, and trade unions in South Africa, he occupies a special place. But also we must pay tribute to Francis Barr, the region that includes Kimba in the Northern Cape, is now named Francis Barr. After Francis Barr, who was a trade union organizer, who mostly organized workers here in Nelson Mandela Bay, which was called Port Elizabeth. But also we should pay tribute to one of the temple three. There's an organization called the Port Elizabeth Black Civic, Civic Organization. So one of the sub-regions here is named after him, is called Champion Galera. Champion Galera was also a trade union member, he belonged to the General Workers Union of South Africa. He was an ordinary worker working for town talk, but he was an anti-apartheid activist. Who unfortunately was killed because of Ascaris, of Joe Masera, who went to spy on him. The apartheid regime killed him brutally with two other people who were what they, they were became known as the Pepper Play. But also, one of the founders of the Federation of South African Women, the other 
organization that led the struggles of women that marched to the Union buildings in 1956 in a day that led to Women's Day in South Africa today was also a trade union organizer, was a worker who was organizing here in Germany. And it's good that one of the subregions is named after her. Her name is Lillian Davis. She was a soft steward. She got to be conscious in the struggles of our people. But also we want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to an organizer who organized workers. We organized the general working class. Government made. So government made organized here and gained this political consciousness and got to recruit and shape the perspectives of many people when he was here in Germany. It's unfortunate that government made gave back to neoliberal and regional children. Tawombe again was a baby who are not companies, who are not associated with the struggles of the workers. But we will always honor Gavan Bey because he is one of the most outstanding leaders in the struggles against the party. He understood a simple fact that in the struggle against racism, do not turn a blind eye over the class character of a party. Don't turn a blind eye over the fact that a party was an instrument of capitalism to exploit the working class. He said that of course you must end a party. You must end racism, but also you must end capitalism. You must not just say we are fine with black capitalists. Because even get black capitalists, they get to be as exploited, they get to be as brutal, they get to be as insensitive on the interests and aspirations of the working class. You do not have to go very far to see what black capitalists put to do our people. In Madagascar, Sarah Ramaphosa is part of the so called black capitalists. He is the one who agitated for the murder and killing the massacre of defenseless workers of Madagascar. And that is what we are dealing with. So government making must be celebrated. And of course, that does not include the neoliberal Tabombe, who is trying to revive a dead organization which we are going to take out of power on the 29th of May. Now, fighters, the question which we should be asking ourselves and which correctly we must ask ourselves and discuss and talk about every day is why do we as the economic freedom fighters pause to talk about Workers' Day? Here, the Eastern King advocate Danny Kofu today is addressing the Workers' Day event in Buffalo City with all the ground forces of the EFL. The Commander-in-Chief and President of the EFL is addressing Workers' Day events and rallies today in Twan, in the capital city of South Africa, where he will be working from, from the 1st of June onwards. He is speaking to workers in Maricana, in Hamastra, in Mamino, and in Sashangu. But also the National Chamber Science in the Western Cape speaking to workers. The Treasurer General is in Pumala, also commemorating Workers' Day. The Deputy Secretary General is in the Northwest. The Secretary General is in Tubakuba in Kwazulu-Natal, in Kanyakude region, where a lot of workers are exploited in the wetland park of Ismangani, so there they are exploited by farm owners. 
So the question to which you are asking is why should the world organization, in the middle of elections, few days before elections, say we must pause to talk about workers and workers' day? It's because that is who we are. The EFF is an organization of the working class and workers. So in every society, we have got divisions of two primary classes. In the capitalist society which we live in, we have got the capitalists, those who own businesses, not small businesses of sponsor shops, those who own capital, who own the land, who own the huge factories, who own the mines, and then we have got the working class as another group. And in the theory which we ascribe to and believe in as the AFM, we say that there is perpetual and irreconcilable differences between the capitalists and the working class. So under no circumstances would you be able to say the capitalists and the working class have got the same difference. And there is no one in a capitalist society who can be neutral, who can say, I am not on the side of the capitalist and I am not on the side of the working class. I am just neutral. There is no neutrality in a class struggle in a capitalist society. Even keeping quiet and not doing anything is a class position. Even when you are silent and not doing anything, we have taken the position of the dominant class because we are saying, let us go on with whatever we have now. So the EFM, in the two contending classes of the capitalist and the working class, is formed as an organization that exclusively defends the interests of the working class. Everything else that we do, every policy position that we advocate for, is for the interest of the working class. Every election manifesto that we adopt and speak about in public is about advising the interests and aspirations of the working class. There are other political parties, majority if not all, who are on the side of the companies for those who own the means of production. And how do you identify them? Every time they speak, they say, what is business going to say about this? What are the investors going to say about this? But we in the EFF, when we sell one land expropriation without compensation, the question we ask is, how is this going to benefit the working class and the poor? And by the way, the working class involves all of us who rely on our labor, on us working for someone to earn a livelihood, all of us who do not own huge businesses, the land, the huge factories, the mines. All of us, including the ones who are unemployed, who are part of the working class, who are part of a class that the EFF is founded to fight on behalf of. So if ever there is a leader of the EFF who says we are concerned about the interests of the capitalist and we are worried about them, you must know that person has defined themselves outside of the economic field of finance. In the EFM, whatever comes to any government institution, whether it's parliament at national level, provincial legislature, municipality council, whenever there's a budget, there's a speech, we ask how the workers and the working class benefit from it. This is who we are as the EFF. In the two contending classes, we are on the side unapologetically and decisively so of the working class. 
That is why when there is a weapon day, we can stop everything as the EFF and say we associate with the interest of the working class. And then what do we do? And what did we do in 2018 when the EFF was founded? We said because we are on the side of the working class, we need ideas. We need a telescope. We need lenses. We need spectacles on how to view society from a working class perspective. That is why we characterize ourselves as a Marxist, Leninist, Padonian organization. Because Marxism, Leninism is the ideology, is the belief system of the working class and workers all over the world. And don't listen to anyone who will tell you that Marxism, Leninism does not work. They are telling lies. You can go and listen to the recent speeches and addresses of the leadership of the Communist Party of China, led by General Secretary Xi Jinping. I already say that China has got more people than the whole of Africa combined. But in the past 30 years, 40 years, China has been able to take out of poverty more than 700 million people. Forty years ago, China's economy was number 100 in the world. As we speak today, China is for the second biggest economy in the world. And in the next 10 years, China will be the biggest economy in the world. And when you listen to the leadership of the Communist Party of China, they say this is all due to the proper application of Marxism Leninism, we the EFF ascribe. So there is proof now that Marxism Leninism can guide the society, can lead a country to have proper ideas to develop the productive forces, to develop the economy, because such is not done for any day profit. Is done for future generations to come. And that is why we are not fearful as the EFF to adopt Marxism, Leninism as an ideology of the working class, as an ideology of the political party that is going to bring about true freedom to the people of South Africa. That is going to bring about true freedom to the people of the African continent. All other ideologies have been attempted. Here in South Africa, they have failed. In 1996, this government, who is claiming to be a paragon of political virtue, he introduced something called the growth employment and the distribution economic policy, which this man failed. And what the ANC was saying that time was that let us make some few people rich and when they are rich they are going to share with us their riches. That is the ideology of the ANC. That is the ideology of the Democratic Alliance. That is the ideology of the kind of freedom parts of all these parties. The EFF doesn't say we must make few people rich in order for us to benefit. It says all of us must reach at the same time. And at the center of that agenda, at the center of that agenda, must be a state, a capable government that develops the productive forces, plays a central role in the ownership and control of many sectors of the economy. That is who we are as the EFF. That is why when you read the details of the EFF lectures for the Facebook, it says let us create a state-owned construction campaign. We will build quality houses for all of our people. Let us create a state-owned road construction campaign. We will build quality roads and protect them whenever they are coming. 
and not rely on tenders. But these ones who are government now, whenever there's a poor hole or there's a problem of damaged infrastructure, a school is damaged, before they repair that, they say, let us go look for business people, tender people, to repair the roads. And in the process of asking that question, they also ask, how do we eat from that business? We have a crisis of electricity in South Africa today. We as the EFM has got the most comprehensive, the most scientifically tested, the most concept-proven approach and strategy on how we are going to end load shaping and have electricity for everyone. But they are not listening to that because our strategy and plan does not involve these people making money out of the crisis. The reason why we are not getting electricity in South Africa today is because rubber ports, Sputa, Rama Hoba, and all of those, when they are they are asking the wrong question of how do we eat out of the electricity crisis? That is why they are always trying to put in independent power producers. They say, let us dissolve this call and go to the private sector and get people to sell electricity to government and government will sell electricity to the people. And as a result, they will be given bribes and benefits from these independent power producers. But the EFL solution does not involve the private sector. It says, let us build the state capacity. One, to revive all the coal power stations into full functionality so that we can generate electricity for everyone. Let us build a 6,000 megawatt nuclear power station which is going to provide electricity for everyone. If you want to participate in the renewable sector of harvesting the wind and the sun for electricity, let us have a state-owned company which is going to invest not only in the distribution of solar panels, but also in the manufacturing of solar panels. We can wait to be a solution for electricity in a spa as all grid solutions are concerned. And in that way, imagine if we were to take a decision here in Nelson Mandela in the Eastern Cape, that now that we have realized that solar panels, when you bring them, all of them, into the grid of ESCOM electricity, they do not work. But when you put in a small house or in a tree, in a small building, in a hall like here, they can have some electricity for a certain extent of time. If we were to take a decision that we are going to install solar panels and inventors in each and every house, here in the Eastern Cape we have to install in more than 2 million houses. And as a progressive organization, that is on the side of the workers, we say we do not want to import the solar panels finished. Let us make them here in South Africa. Imagine the number of jobs you can create for our people. To manufacture two million solar panels and inventors, to employ people who are going to install them, to repair and replace them whenever they are damaged. And that is part of the jobs plan that comes from the economic freedom fighters, which is on the side of the workers. There is no one who is right in their mind who can contest against the superiority of the logic that is contained in the jobs plan, in the electricity plan, in the land plan of the EFF in its manifesto. And those are the things that the EFM says we will do when we take over that. But also, we say the type of jobs that are created by the state must be quality jobs. Workers here in Nelson Mandela will know that those who used to be employed through third parties in the municipality, who used to work for a security company and as the government gets a tenor of the municipality, it is the ESM who are 
and then we manufacture ambulances. And we, 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 we can manufacture thousands and hundreds and thousands of cars. We will of course make some mistakes in the, in the beginning. But with time, we are going to perfect it. We are going to be the best producers of cars here in South Africa in the continent. Even other people in the world will be coming to buy cars from us. And in that way, we have created sustainable jobs for our people. That is what the EFF policy says you should do. That is at the center of the economic emancipation agenda of the economic freedom fighters. There are so many things fighters have to bring from outside that can be made domestically. Almost all the household appliances, they are made outside South Africa. All of us here, we have got electronic gadgets, cell phones, television set home, microwaves, fridges, all of these things. None of them are originally made in South Africa. They are brought from outside. They almost, the entirety of the textile sector, of the clothes that we are making, Almost all of them are made outside of South Africa. The tools that are used in the food system, the plates, the spoons, the cups, the forks, the knives, even a toothpick is coming from outside South Africa. You can go to a spa supermarket or pick and pay or shop right, you will find a toothpick. Made in China. We don't have much industry that is developing anything. That is why the levels of joblessness is at a crisis level here in South Africa. And that is what the EFF is going to change. You saw when Ramaphosa was doing that door and then he met one of these internals who say she is looking for a job. He said, keep on searching for the job. Keep on searching for the job. As if there's a job elsewhere to be found. The reality with South Africa's economy now is that, of course, we've got a problem of unemployment. But to understand that is that we've got a problem of joblessness in the sense that even if we're to look for a job, it is not there. The economy is not designed in a way that can absorb majority of its working age population. South Africa's economy, in the manner in which it is designed, it is now, is unable to absorb all the people who are capable of working, are of working age and need jobs. And the only way to change that is to change the economy to be labor I, I, it, it, it doesn't make sense why people cannot associate natural with the EFF because this is basic logic. It's to say that let us build an economy that is going to look after all of us. That is going to make the so that we can have respectable livelihoods and other goods for those of us who are still growing up. There is no dignity in unemployment. There is no dignity in not having a consistent income that will sustain your livelihood. There is no dignity in sharing a very small bedroom with so many people. There is no dignity with simply not knowing where you are going to get the basic washing products to look after yourself for hygiene and benefits. There is no dignity in not choosing what you want to eat. That whatever they give you, you just eat because you have no choice. There is no dignity in all of you. So what this guy
government of the ANC has been doing since 1994 because it has been having a jobless society. It has been dignified, particularly black people. If you are going to check the unemployment levels amongst white people, it has never been above 7% in South Africa. Because they look after each other. But for a so-called black government, which is not looking after our people, we need to change the economic path of South Africa, to create an economy which is going to create jobs all over the But also we must create conditions for those who choose self-employment to do so without harassment by the state. How do you have a local municipality and government that goes to street corners to dispossess our mothers and sisters of the basic things that they are selling for self-sustainability in street corners? Such will never happen under a year of government. If anything, we're going to give support to all the small-scale traders and give them access to even big markets. Next to the mall, we must build proper, beautiful market stores that if I choose not to buy tomatoes in Pick and Pay or Woolworth, which are very expensive, I must be able to buy from outside in a beautiful, properly designed store of our people, which is given by government for free to the people who are selling tomatoes. And give that support sustainably without shame. And that is what the EFF government will be doing. And of course, fighters, we are going to continue to be in the forefront of the struggle for minimum wages in all the sectors. You know that part of the inspiration for the formation of the EFF was the struggle for 12,500 in Marika. And that was 12 years ago. So we say now as the EFF that all mine workers must have a minimum salary of 15,800 per month. That all farm workers must have a minimum wage of 6,400. That all manufacturing workers, they must not be a manufacturing worker who is paid less than 8,500. They must not be a worker who works for shop right for big and pay for parents, for all of these, who is paying less than 7,000 rand per month. And I think fighters should propose to the central government team that we must immediately take up the struggles of all the workers who work for the retail chain stores, like big and pay, shop right, spa. We must organize all those workers and agree with them that in the next two, three months, your salary must be starting from this 8,500 upwards. And if the owners of those who take change does refuse, we must do all of them what to do to this and stop all of those operations until our demands are high. Because the EFL is not an organization that is just fighting battles in both rooms and just talking too much English without struggling for the ground. We must go and join workers on the ground, particularly retail workers, and say if you don't pay workers this much, you must know you're not going to operate until all the workers' demands are met. That is who we are. That is the struggle that we should take. And of course, we should continue with our struggles for all private security guards. Before we pass the insourcing of all government workers' law, those who are still employed by security guards.
announcement. We as the EFL on behalf of the people of Nelson Mandela, let's take action. Let us make everyone else aware that we are marching against the high levels of crime, particularly made here in Nelson Mandela. And in conclusion, fact, all of us know that we are in the middle of an election program. And our approach is very simple. Is that we talk to people person to person. That every day we must talk to our people. And we have assured you that if you talk to all the voters in your voting districts, in your wards, majority are going to vote for the EFN. The issue is that let us go and do door to door, person to person every day. Our philosophy, our principle, our approach to elections is person to person. That is what defines our movement in terms of this election. Everything else is just secondary, is just complementary. If you see us with billboards and posters, if you see us doing events as part of elections, that is not our primary election approach and strategy. At the center of our election approach is to talk to our people. Because we believe that our people will be able to listen to logic. Our people, if we demonstrate to them that we represent a better future, our people will be able to appreciate that. Also, our people are not fools. Our people are politically conscious. There is not a single adult here in Nelson Mandela in the world of South Africa who does not know that we have got elections on the 29th of May. There is not a single adult who does not know that the ANC has been in power since 1994 and has not brought about the development and improving the living conditions of particularly black people in a manner that is sustainable and can be appreciated. Of course, apartheid ended because of the efforts of so many role players, including people who never belong to political parties, including the international community, including countries outside of the African continent. Who fought for the end of apartheid? The ANC cannot continue to blame our voters and our people that they ended apartheid. In any way, it's not like they ended apartheid. They played a role like all other organizations did. They cannot say that our people must be beholden to mediocrity, to stagnation of the economy. No movement, despite the promises of free education 1994, we are talking today there is still no free education. So let's go to talk to our people. Our people will hear us when we say that this is an organization that is going to bring back our land. This is an organization which is going to create millions of jobs. This is an organization that is going to bring about the sustainability of water and electricity supply. This is an organization which is going to end corruption. This is an organization which is going to bring about free education for all up until higher education level. This is an organization that is going to cancel all the student debts. It doesn't make sense that they have got young South Africans who have passed their degrees, their diplomas, but they cannot gain access to that certificate because they owe a university some 5,000 rand, 10,000 rand. And you have got a government that does not intervene on their behalf. 
action of free education for all our people. Fight us, let's remain focused and disciplined every day. We have done a lot as far as branches, but don't be too quick to celebrate and congratulate yourself. If anything, the numbers that you have gained in your branches, you must be inspired to multiply them by three, by four. You should have spoken to all the voters so that you prepare for a successful victory of the EFF elections. We are going to bring fighters that here in the Eastern Cape, if we are not number one, we are definitely going to number two. Here in the Eastern Cape, we have never seen the formation of the EFF have a ready-made machinery that is ready to fight for elections. Who is saying when we are in the summer that we have got EFF ground forces work new work every day in all the 33 municipalities and sub-regions of Nelson Mandela. From Okawa to Doha to Bears to Dan to Sunday River municipality here in Ado to Makar to Dame here in Port Alfred. Everywhere we have got volunteers of the EFF in Dubai town in Credo, where the EFF has never had a councillor before, but now we've got a lot of volunteers and ground forces of the EFF. In Saki Seas, they know. In Inno Kijima Municipality, where there's high levels of corruption, there are EFF ground forces there. In all the municipalities in Jogwami District, in Elundi, we've got EFF ground forces in Wachasasuno Municipality, in Malifa, in Zayn's Night Spray, in the entirety of the Transland, the EFF is in the strongest position now. In County, Samadha, and in the Municipality KSD, in Uptak, we've got presence there in the Muzahid Municipality, Flagstaff, and Lusiki C. In PSJ, Ponce and John, we've got strong EFF presence. In Nyande, in Kum, in Libor, in all the areas of the Eastern Cape, Baja and in Kum, all the ground forces of the EFF are saying, let us take over this government to liberate the generation. So don't ever be discouraged to think that we are alone here. We are so many and are going to liberate the people of the Eastern Cape. Yeah.